So I, I try to keep up on venture capital uh, trends around the world because where the money goes, the startups go. Right? And uh, here we're talking to a partner from DN Capital about European trends and what's happening. My name is Steve Schlenker. I'm one of the founding partners of DN Capital, London-based venture capital firm. Uh, my background, I've been in private equity for over 20 years. I uh, grew up in the States, was in England for over 12 years, and moved back out to Silicon Valley five years ago to open our U.S. branch office. Yeah. So what are you, you know, um, I've been going to Europe for a long time, more, more than a decade now. More than, um, yeah, a long time. <laughs> And over there, you know, a decade ago, there was very few startups. Now there's entire communities in Berlin and London and Tel Aviv and a few other cities there. What are you seeing happen there and, and how is venture changing its approach and, and how are you helping that? I guess? Sure. So there's you're, a lot there. <laughs> there's a lot there. Uh, I moved to the UK back in 95 and started doing European tech investing around 96. And those early days, there really were very few companies. And then around 98, 99, modeling after the US, everyone wanted to be a startup entrepreneur, but the VC community really didn't know all that much of what they were doing. And you had a lot of what we'd call VC tourists, people who were able to raise money on the back of their investment banking track record or otherwise, who then lost money in 2000, 2001, abandoned the market and abandoned the entrepreneurial community. So entrepreneurship seemed to die off from about 2001 until about 2005, six, when it started re-emerging. Initially with some of those entrepreneurs who were burnt in their first startups, basically bootstrapping the businesses without VC funding, getting successful exits, and then around 2008, 2009, coming back and saying, hey, I've done this twice now, once unsuccessful, once successful. Uh, it was hard doing it without VC funding. Maybe the VC market is caught up and I could come back as a three-peat entrepreneur and try to raise capital. And so we see a lot of that happening in the major markets like London and Paris. Uh, at the same time, in Berlin, we've seen a really vibrant community develop. And uh, I think a lot of this has to do with the Samwar brothers. The Samwar brothers uh, made uh, great success in some of their own startups uh, and then also backing, uh, you know, forming companies that were copies of US models. But the typical model that they had was they would own you know, a large percentage of the company, the entrepreneur would have a very small stake. Uh, and so they would take excellent people out of McKinsey and other consulting firms, train them in how to build scalable businesses. And then these entrepreneurs would say, why am I making all this money for other people? I should do it for myself. So in the last two, three years, we've seen really fantastic trained entrepreneurs coming out and looking for VC funding where they say, now I can own the majority of the pie. And this has proven a great market, one of the most vibrant markets in all of the West coming out of Berlin. And luckily we've been a big part of that. Tell me about some of the companies that you're seeing extraordinary growth in a short period of time. Yeah, we have one company that we seed funded in 2010. It just passed 150 million revenue run rate. This is a company that's in the uh, baby goods product space. We have another company that's in the used car space that is 18 months old, just passed $100 million revenue run rate and growing 20% a month. Uh, we have another company that's also e-commerce around eyewear that's approaching $80 million run rate. Uh, these are uh, two Berlin, one Munich with a lot of operations in Berlin. Uh, so yes, very fast growing companies on a global scale. What is it about Berlin? Well, I have a hint of where the guys who started SoundCloud said they moved to Berlin because of the nightlife and the, and the, <laughs> the ability to go, you know, the music scene there is really extraordinary, particularly if you like new, newer electronic music, which all the kids do, right? I was just at Coachella and saw this close up. What, what's, why are these, uh, why are only a few cities causing uh, entrepreneurial activity? Well, in Berlin particularly, you have a lot, of young, a lot of young people, some universities, uh, a lot of incubators, over a dozen from our last count. The rents are very inexpensive, both business rents and personal rents. Uh, there's also this, this feeling like nothing's being handed to you. You have to take it for yourself. I think that's coming out of 
East Germany and the whole process they've gone through over the last 20 years where they've moved from you know, sort of a, a really sheltered communistic environment into one where they have an opportunity for a free economy. I find East Berlin to be more vibrant than West Berlin and also uh, just more fun. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, groups like Point Nine Ventures who have done a great job, not just on the tech scene, but also in the social scene, organizing parties and events for the entrepreneurs where they can meet and greet. It's a really fun city. Uh, it has a lot of the flavors of being in uh, South Kensington or being in some of the nightlife of New York City, uh, but it's got the passion and the entrepreneurialism that you get in San Francisco. What are the challenges to those newer companies that are seeing this extraordinary growth in building a global brand? Are, are, do they have aspirations to do that? I assume they do. When some, something's working that well, you, you're like, hey, maybe this will work in other countries as well. Um, absolutely. And what you find are the companies that are creating marketplaces or the companies, as you mentioned, the music space, uh, they're all looking at global opportunities. Get a beachhead inside of Germany, then expand into neighboring countries, and then try to find an anchor into the U.S. And that's one of my roles within DN is to try to help the European companies that my partners in London back and bring them over here to the U.S. Um, so the car company, for example, we will definitely be bringing to the U.S. We have another company that is the whole team from uh, City Deal, the European Groupon, uh, that have formed a new company, and we're bringing that into Italy at the moment, into Spain, and we'll bring that into the U.S. Uh, yes, absolutely. But it is challenging because a lot of the people have built the local branches for, for example, a Sam Arbeck business, but haven't seen the global aspirations, haven't really seen how do we build out the mid-level managers, how do we incent them, how do we create the right systems uh, to give them freedom to build out businesses, but also centralized culture and centralized uh, structures. For people who don't know DN Capital, uh, how much money do you have under uh, management and, and what kind of firm are you, are you? Sure, so we're on our third fund. It's about $110 million at present. Our previous two funds were about half that size. Our best known companies were uh, in DECA, we were the only European investor and helped bring that company into Europe. Uh, it was successfully sold to Oracle about two years ago for about $1.1 billion. Uh, Shazam, which is a British company that we've helped bring into the US and is now doing uh, quite well in the music space. Uh, so we tend to focus at the layer that touches human beings. We are involved in uh, digital media and ad tech. We do e-commerce and marketplaces and enterprise software. but business unit enterprise software as opposed to things that would be buried deep inside the uh, CIO's office. What, what's changing about venture capital right now? I, you, you gave me a little hint off camera before the cameras start rolling that the way that the um, LPs or the, the, the investors that invest in your fund are changing their, their uh, behaviors. Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Well, if you look at Europe is a, as a microcosm relative to the venture community overall. The number of VC firms has shrunken by three quarters since 2000, and the number of active VCs is down about three quarters from that. So we're looking at fewer than 100 active investors in the IT VC space compared to 2000 around the time of 2000, 1800 and change around 2000. Uh, part of that is because the LPs have gotten tired of the idea of waiting 10 or more years to receive liquidity from early stage investments. That's pushed the VCs to be more creative, either in some cases moving into later stage venture, which is really disappointing for the young entrepreneur. The young entrepreneur doesn't want to just have angel funding or blind money. They want the support systems of venture capital. Uh, but if the VCs are all moving into companies with 10, 20, 30 million of revenues because that's what their LPs are asking for. It's a shame for our industry. Uh, one of the trends we're trying to push is the idea of looking at taking your best company from one fund and crossing over into your new fund. Now this is heresy in terms of the LP community. Uh, historically, people would cross over when they're taking one of their poor performing companies that they need to bail out. And that's given the idea of crossover is a really bad name. But if you're an investor and you can get early liquidity in your portfolio, then the net effect is you're playing with house money. So all of the other early stage investments that VC makes, you now have the time and the patience to wait those companies out. So I'm, I'm noticing this trend where uh, these, these young companies are growing so fast 
that they're that the amount of capital they're go getting is skyrocketing as they cross that chasm. Uber is a good example of that getting a quarter billion, half a billion or a quarter billion. I forget what the number was, but it was a big number. It's yeah. like whoa! I remember when Color was shocking, getting forty million dollars. Right now we're seeing some of these uh, newer companies get uh, two hundred fifty million dollars. That's a lot of capital. Well, you have uh, a lot of the tech companies are really pushing off their IPOs. And so rounds that historically would have been done through the public markets are being done by private markets. And you're seeing hedge funds, you're seeing people like Tiger Management and others coming into private companies. Now, part of that is to have thematic visibility on what they want to do with the rest of their public equity portfolio. But part of it is because these young companies are saying, if we go public and we don't have the ability to predict revenues for two quarters or three quarters forward, the stock market's gonna slam us. And their investors are saying, we're locked in for 12, sometimes 18 months. If we go public and you miss a quarter, then we've just lost a lot of our value. Yeah, I've seen, since I'm, our studio here is here near Moscone in San Francisco, I still see a lot of companies coming here from around the world partly to raise money, partly for PR, partly for talent. Do you still see that trend continuing or do you see a shift where European companies can stay in Europe, get European funding and, and, and stay Europe, totally European based or do they still need to come to San Francisco at some point? So we've increasingly seen Sandhill Road firms investing alongside us and alongside some of our compatriots in the European venture market in the growth equity rounds. Now some of this started with Sequoia going into Klarna and you've seen Sky uh, Scanner, who recently also received a lot of funding. Spotify received funding from US VCs. Uh, so there is a move in that direction. For younger companies, particularly first time entrepreneurs, it does feel like they still need to have a presence in the Valley in order to attract Valley based uh, VCs, uh, at least until they get to a Series B or Series C. What we're trying to do is to keep the technology base in Europe where there's uh, lower salaries, there's also less competition for employees, and then have either the CEO or uh, some commercial people be based here in the Valley. What, what else are you seeing happen in the world that's interesting in 2014? So the, uh, the movement in terms of convergence of mobile, tech, and health is really a trend going forward in a way that we had not envisioned in the past. We've always been a, a software layer investor. We've actually made three investments now in wearables or Internet of Things, which we never would have thought of doing because there's a hardware risk to that as a VC firm. Uh, and it has a lot to do with this convergence that we're seeing now. I'm envisioning a world in a few years' time where I can take a transdermal patch, like a nicotine patch, be able to go into a presentation with you on camera and have it deliver uh, dopamine to give me a nice calm relaxation before speaking and then show up on my mobile phone as here's my calendar event here's what I was doing at that time here's the exact release that was given to me and here's what the impact was on my system so that I can match out my diary management and my health management at the same time all controlled through a mobile device that's not that far away the technology exists today I saw the uh, silicon based needles uh, are being developed in an R&D lab at uh uh, Cork, Ireland, right? Yeah. And uh, there's going to be all sorts of patches that measure all sorts of stuff about your blood. If you're a diabetic, this stuff is going to be really nice compared to pricking your finger on a little needle mm -hmm. and uh, you know causing you some pain, stuff like that every hour to, to check your glucose level. Yeah, we have companies here that uh, we have one that has a wearable device that helps measure your breathing patterns and then the consumer application is to reduce your stress level to stay calm by controlling your breath and seeing that on a mobile phone. The medical application is to be able to monitor your elderly parents who might have COPD or emphysema or to remotely check on your kids to see if they're taking their aspirator if they have asthma. There's a, a good community in uh, Cambridge, England uh, that are dealing with this uh, internet of things. I mean I, there's a there's a lot of expertise in that area um, with the black raspberry pie and, mm -hmm. and the arm arm chips that came out of there. Uh, what are you, are you seeing the same thing? Or is that exciting you guys as investors? Or? We are. Uh, we're seeing a lot going on in that space. We have investments down in Bristol, which touch on Internet of Things, and also 
touch on how do you, uh, how do you inexpensively manage the, uh, the risk that systems fall over, whether those are systems for consumers or systems for businesses. Uh, there's some also great consumer applications coming out. Uh, our friends uh, uh, Saul Klein and Robin have invested in a startup that had a very successful Kickstarter campaign for how do you allow young kids to build their own computer using Raspberry Pi chips. So a lot of excitement going on in that vertical. We're also seeing in Europe a lot of old line industries, traditional laggards in the technology world, who are now adopting technology as a way to leapfrog competition. We have a startup in the UK that is trying to replace the estate agent with an entirely online system so that for a single fixed fee, you can have the home visits, the uh, conveyancing, the valuation, everything dealt with in one go. Uh, radical uh, reduction in cost from, in Europe, 2%, in the US, 6%, down to literally a fixed fee of a few hundred pounds. Um, do you help uh, American companies come to Europe? Like, like Uber is now showing up all over, over Europe. Um, and Samwer Brothers, you, you know, ha have taken advantage of the uh, inability for San Francisco-based entrepreneurs to really understand the local markets there because they're speaking different languages, there's different customs, different privacy laws, all sorts of fun stuff. Are you helping uh, San Francisco companies or thinking of helping them uh, grow their markets into the European Ab field? Absolutely. Our first big success in DECA we introduced them to Tesco's, which became their first million dollar customer globally, and even at the time of exit was one of their biggest customers. Uh, and then introduced them to one of their leading channel partners, where we tested out a channel strategy in Italy before layering that strategy on in the US. More recently, we invested in a company in LA, which is one of the largest uh, SPMDs for Facebook, and we helped bring them over into Europe. We recently hired the former head of uh, Google UK as the head of that company's European operations. So yes, very much so. Uh, part of that is myself helping uh, find the deals. It's also my colleagues in London who are working with me to find deals and bring the, the entrepreneurs from Europe, marry them up with the great companies here. Anything else we should talk about? Well, you know, I think that we have a number of companies that are really cutting edge that are almost uh, almost on the next extreme of what's going on. Uh, these are not our typical enterprise software deals or e-commerce companies. There's one that uh, has recently gained a lot of attention that you might not have heard of, uh, or you might have heard of it. It was called uh, a glyph by Avagent. Mm -hmm. And so this is an attempt to have, uh, have uh, noise canceling headphones that convert into a 3D video player by taking the part that fits over your head pivoting in front of your eyes and then pivoting back when you're done. Uh, this was part of our research that we did in terms of wearables in Europe that we then found through a European entrepreneur who introduced us to the company here in the US. Is that y Yobi Benjamin's company? Yobi Benjamin yeah. is, is the, the key person at the company in San Francisco uh, and it was introduced to us through a wearables conference that was brought to us by a friend of ours from Europe. Very cool. Well, so that will be one that you should see us bringing into Europe soon from the U.S. Very cool. It's, it, this whole wearable space is very interesting. Um, I don't think anybody has really uh, figured it all out, I, including Nike. They just uh, laid off people doing the field band, and everybody's speculating it's because they know what's coming from Apple, and they're just saying that we're out, you know? But, <laughs> but uh, nobody's really f unlocked the wearable space in a huge way yet, have well, they? how many devices can you have on your wrist at one time? Yeah. Maybe one. So the question is, do you want to compete for the, being that one device on your wrist? Or do you want to go into software that sits on other people's devices? Or do you want to find a different part of the body that you put something on? I have yet to see someone do a wearable that sits behind your ear and that duels as a wireless uh, headset for your cell phone, but also is a sensor and a monitor. Sooner or later, someone's going to come out with fashion items like a wearable toe ring. They're going to come out with you know, wearable rings for your hand. Sort of, sort of sounds like you're joking, but I, I know a, a company building electronic uh, 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 rings and stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's a lot of fun stuff coming. 
this is a great time to be in venture capital. There are great companies emerging. Uh, we are seeing a whole new wave of entrepreneurs on both sides of the pond. So I love what I do and I wouldn't change it for anything. Very cool. Do you like seeing uh, the companies uh, pitch you cold or do you only take referred uh, companies? We look at uh, 30 to 40 deals a week. Most of those are pitched cold. I would say about a quarter of our investments are companies that we've gotten to know cold. Um, the other three quarters are from warm introductions of people that we've either made money with in the past or who we've known for many years. But again, the entrepreneurs themselves are often new to the firm. So I love hearing new ideas. I like the passion of young entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm personally more biased towards hearing pitches from 20 year olds than hearing pitches from people my age. I think they just have a more finger on the pulse in terms of what's going on. Very cool. Where do you, uh, where can we find you? Uh, I'm based in Palo Alto three quarters of my time. Uh, and then the rest of the time I'm over in London at our headquarters just off of, of Green Park. And where on the internet can we find you? Uh, www.dncapital.com uh, or my, uh, uh, my Skype is just Eschlanker, and it's easy enough to find me, uh, Twitter or otherwise. Thank you very much. A pleasure.